It's always we said it's always been at 530. Yeah. It is 530. I'd like to call this work session of the uh, College Place City Council to order. Uh, it is a work session. No decisions will be made this evening. This is for information only for uh, the uh, City Council to help them consider <coughs> items in the future. Uh, if we could stand for a Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have a moment to uh, have silence to center ourselves before this starts. Thank you all very much. Uh, this evening we have uh, three items on our workshop, a uh, legislative update uh, from Brian Enslow, our lobbyist, uh, with this, uh, keeping us in touch with the, what's going on with the state, a uh, presentation uh, on stormwater utility and a presentation on a proposed ambulance utility. Uh, Mr. Enslow, Brian Enslow, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Uh, Brian Ansel, I am your lobbyist. I, uh, uh, I, represent, I have the privilege of representing the city this um, legislative session. And um, more than anything, really want to just provide an opportunity to get an uh, opportunity for us to kind of uh, learn a little bit more about my background, for me to give you some uh, kind of some summary highlights of this past legislation and then talk about maybe what we see happening moving forward in the future. Um, so we can go ahead and just go to the next slide. Um, so, here's what, like I said, what we're gonna talk about, maybe a little bit about me, agenda, results, um, some insights, and um, I always say questions, comments later, but really, um, anytime you wanna interject, any questions you have, draw them out. Go ahead. So, um, my first job after college was answering phones at the governor's office. And I worked for the legislature, I worked for a couple different executives. Um, I worked for the Washington State Association of Counties for eight years. Um, uh, I, I, I feel very strongly about service and connection to the public. Um, it's a big part of my business model. I've been in business for myself for about two years, but um, when I think about who are the clients I want to represent, who I want to be a part of that service is uh, really cool in my business. And it's one of the reasons why I really enjoy representing any research to yourself. Uh, at, a, uh, at, a, at a level, at a fundamental level, when I go talk to your delegation, right, there's always this value that I can tie back to. And it's the value that you serve the same citizens that they serve, you're elected by the same citizens that they're elected by. And although you might disagree with your delegation about how things have done, you're all just trying to do the best. So that's really something that means a lot to me. It's, it makes it a really rewarding experience to represent you. So I want to mention that. Uh, as I mentioned, worked for the Association of Counties for eight years, worked for the Lock Administration, worked for the Gregoire Administration as a budget writer, also worked for the House of Appropriations as a budget writer. So I've kind of worked in Olympia now for nearly 20 years. I have an executive perspective, a legislative perspective, and I've worked on local government. So that's kind of about me. If you have any other questions about my background, I'd love to answer it. No? All right. Let's look at the next slide. Uh, Washington State has binary cycle. This was a short session. Normally during a short session, we kind of have a continuation of, of maybe larger thorny policy issues that didn't get resolved last year. In this case, those things would be Hearst. They would be, um, which is the, the water law case. Feel free to nod or, or one way or another if, if I want to go slow or fast, depending on what I'm seeing, okay? And, or McCleary, which of course was the education funding piece, there's still some things hanging out there. Um, this year was really unique in that you had a majority change in the Senate, which, not, which doesn't usually happen on off election cycles. So you had a member of the Senate pass away, which was uh, unfortunate. There was a special election to fill that unexpired term. There was a Republican. The Republicans lost that seat as a Democrat. And now all of a sudden you have a Democrat in the governor's office, Democrat in the House, and Democratic Senate. 
So instead of having a balanced government, which I think personally is best for local government, because I think local government is pragmatic, local government is implementers, that pothole is not partisan. It just needs to be filled, right? So I think when there's balanced government, I think government does, local governments do well. When it's one party or another, I think we're vulnerable to, to that kind of situation. In this case, what you saw was um, a very progressive agenda and lots of new policy issues that came forward. So we had to resolve in Cleary, we had to resolve Hearst, and we had the situation where we had the shift in majority and all that that entailed. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so that's the context we were operating. Um, we worked very hard to support the capital budget. As you know, in the underlying budget, there was 900,000 for the placement of uh, well number one. So, and that was being contingent on hers. The other thing that we worked on, and uh, your city manager was excellent in that case, was to get something ginned up and ready in the event that there might be an opportunity for a supplemental budget. Um, it, it happened in a little bit different way than I thought. Often in supplemental sessions, they might do a new bond bill um, based on available resources and things like that. They might actually do. In this case, because of Hearst, they had some extra capacity in the existing bond bill because of the delayed start time in capital projects, right? They said, we're going to fund this many projects and we're going to fund 24 months of them. Well. They didn't get Hearst done until January, and they didn't have a budget done until January, so they only had 18 months of projects that they needed to fund. So it created some extra capacity. Uh, you as a city, and we were there to jump in right with that well number two, really told the story of how it was emergent, public safety, public health issue, concern, and your delegation did a great job. Um, very collaborative delegation, worked on this with a laser focus and made sure I was in there. So, um, Fantastic. Uh, we also work closely with the Association of Washington Cities to support their agenda. Yes? I'm sorry. Um, I've never quite understood the Hearst issue. Sure. Can you give me the TLDR of what they actually decided? Okay. So, permit exempt wells. And who is responsible for deciding whether there was available water? The case that came out of Watkins said it's no longer a state responsibility, it's going to be a local responsibility to the town. Okay? So the big piece on the Hearst case was that went back to being state responsibility. And then the other big piece was how much water you can draw, which it had been, uh, uh, I'm not, uh, like 3,000 gallons per day. That sounds right. And then the compromise was 950. There's all sorts of comp there's all sorts of caveats around that, mm -hmm. um, depending on what basin you are and how it plays in. And um, you have an excellent staff here in planning department. We can probably tell you specifically how it applies here. <coughs> One of the pieces that is maybe of more interest to us, there was this other case called Foster that came out of Thurston County, which was how you find mitigation and can you use offsite places to then mitigate um, uh, water impacts and find water resources that way. And this legislation had a pathway forward for those projects as well. Oh, uh, good. And, and, and created a pathway for that. So it was, it was good all around. I think for local government, I think it was a good compromise. I think we got a better deal than we, than, than we could have expected. <coughs> it's a great question. Thank you. Uh, and as always, uh, I'm there. I'm monitoring. I'm looking to be flexible. I'm looking for opportunities. We're communicating on a uh, a weekly, if not daily basis, as sessions going on, depending on the issue. So, okay, the next one. Uh, I've already oh, sorry. <laughs> no, we've already covered that. <laughs> no, it's good. Um, so there's your first piece. There's what was in the capital budget. Um, we know that there's still going to be more projects going forward. Um, um, I had a great opportunity today to spend the afternoon with, um, with your staff. Uh, Got to see the, the city and a lot of the great opportunities that are happening here. Also, some of the challenges, thinking about uh, uh, some other things that we might need some state assistance on. So that was good. Okay, can we go? Um, homelessness is a problem in all communities. It's obviously becoming uh, a bigger issue here locally. Um, it's been very frustrating. Uh, there's a lot of smart people working on it. 
um, not coming up with great solutions or panaceas. This, from a policy standpoint year, there was um, what I think some really great strides forward. Um, there was a piece of legislation that basically said landlord can't discriminate on based on source of income. So if there's a if there's a state support or a local voucher that's providing resources for an individual, that that can't like put them lower in the priority. Um, I don't want to get too wonky into this next one, but if you're interested, let me know. But basically, there was for disabled individuals, depending on whether it's temporary disability or permanent disability, there's different pots of money, and um, and this kind of resolves this and fixes it and gets rid of the disincentive in the system. And then document recording fee was made permanent, was extended, and creates lots of additional resources for this region. Uh, Could you I, elaborate a little bit on what the document recording fee is? So, uh, that, so specifically what it is, is um, under current law going into session, it was, it's, it's a, like a roughly a $50 charge on every um, title transaction that is recorded at the county. So when you do, um, and it's not just when land transfers, but if you, if you change your lots and other things. So, so um, there was, and that, that charge was to support homeless services. It was set to sunset in four years. What this legislation did was remove the sunset and then move that charge on, doc on, on recording of documents from $50 in front of that 22 additional dollars of which the majority will stay locally. It's administrated by the county, but you see the benefits here locally as well. Excuse me. Sure. Does that have any um, inflation component, or will it just stay 72 no. until they go back to fix it? No, it, it stays fixed. It's not something like title insurance that's based on the value of the property. It's a fixed rate. You, the inflation would be down, uh, volume, Mm -hmm. More, if you have more housing units, more volume would generate a, an increase. But for the most part, it's going to stay flat. Yeah, yeah. Good question. Um, we didn't get very far in economic development, and um, arguably, it wasn't a short session. It wasn't a session for it. Wasn't a priority. There was really um, kind of a lack of vision, lack of impetus. Um, the the Economy cooking in the Puget Sound um, is arguably good for the state, but definitely we feel the impacts differently. And so um, I think sometimes when the economy is going really, we're really well in the Puget Sound, they lose sight of the pressing need to continue to see economic development in other areas. And so how do we have this one Washington concept when the state's looking at a three billion dollar surplus and Google and Amazon, okay, you know the analogy I use in a lot of my presentations, and uh, you know the Puget Sound, Puget Sound drinks, we get the hangover, right? We get the rising home costs, we get the inflation, we get homeless issues, we get other things, but not necessarily the resources, of the economic growth. So those are the things we need to think about as we move forward, um, kind of these policies. So I'm going to the next slide. Maybe you can convince them that economic growth over here would um, help slow down housing prices over there. It's, it's, <laughs> a, very, it's a very reasonable argument, and, and, and that's sometimes difficult. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, yeah. <laughs> makes too much sense, right? So um, one of the things I wanted to point out is um, there's been a 15% increase in general state what state general fund revenue that's mostly driven by sales tax right uh, new homes housing starts sales tax mostly uh, that's that's not sustainable it's been 40 percent increase in um, uh, the actual size of the budget and actual spending since 2009 2010 so we're now the state is now spending 45 billion dollars for every two years in cash and that's 40% of what they were doing about a decade ago. Um, that, that's, that's not sustainable, and I don't, I'm not criticizing the forecast. The forecast is conservative. The, the, the state forecast, it's like, the forecaster said, okay, here's what actual collections are. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it's, well, here's what actual collections are. I'm gonna say the forecast is this. 
But this, over a decade, and over year over year, is still not what we really think is going to happen or has happened historically. So, and the reason why I bring that up is the relationship between local government and state government um, is at a little bit of a detente right now because there's money in the bank of the state. But as we remember during the Great Recession, you know, when the, when the water starts to dry up around the water and we look at the other animals a little differently, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the state started shifting responsibilities down to locals, started making, you know, wanting to pass policy but not wanting to pass the funding. <coughs> those, those types of issues start to arise when you know, you have budget instability. So that's something to watch. Like, we don't, you know, we know there's going to be a market downturn. Maybe we're already starting it, maybe we're not, maybe it's six months from now. You know, I couldn't tell you, I'm not an economist, but I do know, like, it's inevitable, and so that's something to watch. And that budget that's been passed is, it's balanced, it makes sense, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's, it's somewhat, it's unsustainable in, in a long term sense. So that's something to think about in that relationship. Capital budget, we're at the epicenter of McCleary. Um, levies are passing, it's a very good environment statewide. The single biggest appropriation in the capital budget is the school matching. The capital budget's roughly 4.6 billion, uh, don't quote me on that. The, the state match on school construction was 1.8 of that. So um, as we're moving through this, um, the bond model looks pretty good. Spending's going up, there's capacity there, but a lot of that's been eaten up by school construction. And that's going to be the case for the next couple of years. So when we think about how we compete and what resources are available for local government broadly, whether it's through the Public Works Trust Fund, whether it's through CUR, whether it's through MATCA, um, I'm using uh, I'm using acronyms because sometimes because sometimes I don't. Yeah, I beat the staff acronyms. up when we use acronyms. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry about Some that. Some of them. <laughs> Some of them, some of us know the acronyms yeah. better than the actual. I, I, yeah, I know. Trying, yeah, so I thought the long and short of it is when you think about the infrastructure tools that are available in the capital budget, whether it's just directly community projects or other things for stormwater or for pipes and things like that, there's 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 a fair amount of competition for that right now because of that big wave of school construction going, and that's really the take home that I wanted to have. Um, this was a really hard session. And um, you, as I mentioned and alluded to this before, there was, a, there was this backlog of a very progressive agenda. And I, I, you know, I, I don't have, um, this is not a value statement, I'm just, I'm just, observe, I'm just reporting on what. So you had, um, you had things that really pushed at some core values of the Republican minorities. And they left at the end of session feeling like they got ran over. Um, the high water mark for the minority was Hearst, which happened in, in, in mid-January. And then for the next month and a half, they got crushed on issues that were very hard for them. Uh, reproductive parity, uh, gender reassignment, things of that nature. Um, difficult issues for them. And so it was a really contentious session. Did any of you follow the public records issue? This gentleman probably did here. So, so uh, the legislature, the, the 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 press corps broadly brought a suit against the legislature, saying we think you're subject to the Public Records Act the same way you are. The legislature said no. They lost in Superior Court, and then they decided to pass a bill to say no. We're the final word on this. Well, the governor vetoed that bill, and uh, based on quite a bit of pressure, record volume. Uh, really good lobbying and effort on behalf of the press school. Um, and uh, that just caused the whole place to melt down. So they went home pretty unhappy. Um, and it's going to take a while to patch that up together. But a lot of people retire. We're going to have a lot of shifts in majority, so there's going to be a lot of sorting out. Um, you're experiencing that here locally, right? Representative Neely has announced his retirement. So you've, you've seen that happen here. Um, some other things are potentially in flux here as well. Um, and election trends. So right now, the, the D's hold the Senate by the slimmest of majorities, 28-24. The D's hold the House by the slimmest of majorities, 50-48. So, 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 so the numbers are very close, but the, but the, the parties are getting further apart. And instead of having the traditional bell curve, right, where your two-thirds majority is right down the middle, it's a little bit inverted. Where you have, you know, you have a Democratic caucus, 
And I'm painting in broad brushes here that's really pretty liberal, and a Republican caucus that's really pretty conservative instead of moderates. And, and I think that's likely to continue. Um, arguably, that's a function of the top two primary system. Maybe not, there's some debate about that, but I think that's likely to continue. So you continue to see those margins pretty close, um, but the caucus is kind of starting to get further and further apart. Last slide. Uh, this isn't the one where we added. Okay. So um, what we're looking at as we move forward, of course, is um, um, I, I mentioned it earlier when we talked about uh, giving some state help for waste water treatment, um, looking at some additional tools for economic development, whether it's um, uh, uh, local tax, like tax increment financing, um, other financial tools to help um, fund that infrastructure um, and really develop this community in a way that we want to see it grow. Um, those are the things that um, the preliminary conversations I've had with, with Mike and we'll continue to work with you over this in order to develop and have that platform ready uh, next session. Great. All right. That's what I have for you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, are there going to be any like legislative access days over the summer? I know in the past they used to do that sometimes. Um, specifically, um, I don't know. I think we can talk. Yeah. I don't typically, the only one that I'm aware of is either in January or February, the Association of Washington Cities Legislative Action Day. Since I've lived in Washington, I've never experienced a summer one. I don't know, unless you really so maybe I misinterpreted specifically, but you know, right, your members are very active. They had a town hall yesterday. Um, when I come to town, I try to meet with them. Um, have you had like a delegation breakfast in the past or things like that in November or December? Uh, is that kind of what you're talking about? Or? Um, things like that are often, what I'm recalling is I, and it's been 10 years, but um, we're like regional get togethers. Oh. Where um, off session, like in the summers and so forth, um, there would be like, uh, Central Washington or Eastern Washington, where um, the representatives and senators would get together along with local government folks or lobbyists or whoever wanted to and kind of talk about issues coming up that were more regional in scope. I don't know who organized those. Yeah, about the only thing similar to that, but it really didn't have the legislators at the <coughs> AWC puts on this event called Small City Connectors that occur during the uh, summer where the small cities technically get together uh, with AWC staff and the land a speaker or two to discuss the issues. Uh, a lot of ones I've been to at that, though, uh, the legislators don't really show up to those. Uh, Terry did the, the, at the one in uh, Dayton. Yeah, I was just wondering because it's really difficult for me to get away during session usually because that's when I'm teaching. So no, I understand that. No, I that. no we certainly, but we certainly can ask them to come and chat with us sure. as a group. Great. And okay. since one of them lives in the city, we can. Yeah. Well, that's got its own set of issues. All right. Um, well, thank you very much. Thank really you. Appreciate your time. I know you have a full agenda. So thank you, Brian. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. So next on the agenda is our stormwater utility. Uh, Mr. Gordon is has a worse voice than I do. Can we actually swap them? Oh, of course we can actually swap Sorry. them. So next on the agenda is our ambulance utility. Uh, Peter Moy, I'm a principal at uh, FCS Group, and uh, we do a number of different types of uh, fire studies, and uh, doing ambulance utility rates is one of the things that we do. We've done them for almost almost every city that has them. And so um, when we were asked to take a look at whether or not you should uh, uh, do 
and have an ambulance utility, um, we were asked to do the cost of service study. And so if we just can move to the next uh, slide. So one of the things that we'll talk about today is really just talking about um, the key elements of the, the legislation. I'm not sure how familiar you are with the, the legislation. Um, our whole sort of cost of service framework and the, some of the preliminary results. Um, some of the key cost assumptions as well as the cost of service and the rate calculations. Um, and then we also did five-year forecast. And so this, these are all sort of um, what we saw call preliminary results. And if there's some other scenario or something that you'd like to see us do, then we can certainly do them before we issue a final uh, a draft and a final report. Um, and then the last thing we'll talk about is sort of what do you think are some of the policy issues. So next slide. So the, the legislature, way back, uh, probably like 14, 15 years ago, uh, authorized city councils and uh, actually and subsequently uh, regional fire authorities and other districts to be able to create what's called an ambulance utility. And that was a result of a lawsuit um, that happened over in uh, Kennewick, which said uh, you can't charge uh, this, what we call this ambulance utility fee. And, and then what the legislature did is they said, hey, we need to fix that. And so they passed this legislation. And so now um, the cities are able to go back and charge this fee. However, what, when you do this, now you have to do a cost of service study. Um, and one of the things that we, that's one of the things we do. You can't include capital costs for like a fire station or any facilities. Um, you also have to define what we call availability cost as well as what we call demand cost. And basically the demand cost and, and the way we do it is anytime uh, a staff member is called out on a call, uh, we consider that time demand time. And anytime they're in the station waiting for calls, we assume that that's availability. And uh, as we get into it, we'll talk a little bit about how we go about doing that. Um, the last, last thing that they did also, because as this legislation went through, um, they, they exempted Medicaid-eligible persons in nursing homes, as well as persons who would be on Medicaid who are receiving all in-home services, except they're, they're at home, but they're receiving some similar types of care. So, next slide. So, what we did is give you sort of a, a cost of service and sort of how we go about doing this. And this is the framework we operate from. We first say, here's what your total budget is. We use 2018's budget. And so you're spending about $1.1 million. And then what we do is we start allocating all those different costs into what we call a fire bucket versus an EMS bucket. And so like all the fire marshal activities are on the fire side. And whenever a call is um, answered, it's a fire call, we take those costs and say that's a fire fire issue, that's fire cost. And so when we get down to it, what we ended up having is showing that basically there's about 50-50 split really, um, where the cost allocated to fire activities are about 535, 535,000. EMS is about 579,000. Now, one of the things that we do also then is when we take say for an example, a full-time firefighter, what we do is we say, okay, well, the time that that firefighter spends on a call for EMS, that's demand time. The time they spend on, uh, on a fire call, that's the fire call or some other kind of uh, emergency, but it's not necessarily an EMS call. And so based on that ratio, we then say, well, okay, when we look at how, how often they're at, the, at work and what the hours they are, how many hours they spent doing EMS calls versus fire calls, we take that time that they're at the station and split it up in the same proportion. So that's the what we call the availability side. And what we did and ended up saying is that, well, when we take all the EMS calls, we found out that there's about $380,000 worth of costs that are associated with the availability side, as well as the demand side, on the about $200,000 on the demand side. And so, uh, we have a sort of a detailed sort of model that we do where we allocate different types of costs and there's some costs, as you can see in the, um, in the legislation, that'll say, well, this has to go to demand, this can be availability, and then there's some gray areas. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so one of the, we made a lot of different assumptions. I won't go through all of this here, but again, salary and benefits are of fire prevention run, all of the fire 
Um, again, we talked about the, how we allocate that time for the paid firefighters. For the volunteers, of which you have many, um, whenever they went out on a call, that was considered a demand cost. And we paid them, we assumed that the stipend that they get paid is um, part of the demand cost. Because they're there, they don't necessarily get paid unless they go out on a call. We would say, we said there's really no availability uh, time or cost to that, okay? Um, and then, we, again, we take all the total time um, and standby time, and we just talked a little bit about that. And uh, administrative costs for, like, the fire chief, we sort of allocated based on maybe total incidents or, or other time, uh, the amount of demand versus fire time versus EMS time. Um, and equipment, again, you have a pretty straightforward idea about, you know, if it's a fire truck, obviously all the maintenance and everything for the fire truck is going to go to the fire side. Anything that deals with the ambulance, an ambulance is going to go onto the uh, rescue and emergency aid side or the EMS. Okay. So, when we put all that stuff together, what we got was, again, you see that it's at 380000 for availability, 199000 uh, for a total of 579,000 cost for um, EMS services and ambulance services. What we then do is we say, okay, what are some of the revenues? And so for your city, you receive a part of an EMS levy of $290,000 that's budgeted. And so this is a choice that we made, at least. We said, well, we'll put all that to availability. And then on all the transport revenue, working with the city of Walla Walla's fire department and getting all the, the reimbursements and the number of calls, one of the things we had to do was, because you don't transport and you plan on doing that transport, we had to take all the calls that you went on and then try and match those calls with a call from Walla Walla that took somebody for that same call and took them to the hospital and transport. So we tried to, and we have the transport times and things from Walla Walla's uh, incident reports. Um, unfortunately, there are different numbers, but based on the time and everything else, we were able to come up with something. So we came up with the demand time. Now, out of that, you have about a thousand EMS calls a year, and of that number, there's probably about 200 transports that uh, the city of Walla, Walla did. And of that 200 ones, out of the revenue that you receive for doing that transports, they received about 70,000. We were conservative on this maybe one year, I think for 2016 it might have been 75 or closer to 80, but for our purposes we try and be fairly conservative. So there's 70,000, so what we end up getting in the end, after we take out all the revenues, the, the, the transport revenues have to go, the law says they have to go against the demand cost, and so we've done that. And so now we have, in terms of demand cost, we, we have 129,000 of costs that we have to recover through our, our rates, and we have about 90000 to recover through our rates for availability. Now again, if um, at least in terms of the EMS levy funds, you know, we could change that, and we'll go into that a little bit later. Okay, so, well, what does it all look like? We work with um, Sarah here on the, trying to figure out, well, what are the number of billing units? So we make some assumptions. So every single family home is a billing unit. A multi-apartment building would be, depending on the number of units in the apartment building, would be, each unit would be a, a billing unit. Um, for every commercial business, we just assumed that the business was one billing unit. For all the public areas, so for the city, if you had five different sites, we'd consider each property a billing unit, okay? Because potentially you'd end up having to go there, it's just like your water. Bill. You know, if you have water going to here and you have water going to a park or something, you know, you're still going to end up paying. That's part of the utility aspect of it. And then the biggest thing is, is that for nursing homes, we take each bed and determine, and each bed is a billing unit. And so one of the things that you'll find, so, and then of that, we also uh, did some research, the staff did some research. And we found out that of those nursing homes that are here, uh, about 128 are fully paid by Medicaid. So again, the law says we can't charge those people, and all the costs have to be picked up by the rest of the group, which is this, these regular billing units. Okay? All right, so one of the things that we also take a look at, because we have demand charges, is well, we're, who's, who's causing all the calls? 
And so when we took the call data, what we found was, well, about a third of the calls are coming from the nursing homes. And single families, about you know, half the calls, and the rest are coming sort of from the, the various other places, the commercial side, the businesses, uh, the streets, and you know, publics, public agencies, um, and multifamily. So one of the things that you have to do when we're talking about how do we consider what to charge, how are we going to recover that I think it was whatever the or the demand side. How are we going to recover that 129,000 on the demand cost? Well, one of the ways we first do it is we take the um, the demand cost and we split it up based on the on who's using the, the service. And so a third of the cost and a half of the cost of that 129,000 is going to the single family customer class, and in terms of the nurse home, they're getting roughly a third of that cost as part of their their demand charge. Okay? Next slide. So, um, as you can see, what happens is when you have the number of percentage building units, um, one of the things that we did, you know, in the five-year forecast, we just wanted to show that in the end, we're, we're talking about given what you know about development that's occurring in the city, um, you know, in 2019, when we started looking at the 2019 rates, there probably are going to be about 40 single-family homes coming online, as well as another 185, 180 multifamily building units. Other than that, we assume basically there'd be about 1% growth in the, the building units um, in the future. Uh, next slide. So, um, oh, can we go back up, go forward, I guess. You're going back. Oops. Next slide. Sorry there we go. Uh, so now go to nine. There we go. So when we when we calculate all of this, so one of the things that we do is okay. So remember, we had that demand charge. Once we identify how much cost is associated with that, we then divide it by the number of billing units in that class. And so as you can see, what happens when we do that? Um, is because single family has a lot of units, their demand charge is $20 a year versus a nursing home, when you're talking about just the, the bed units, they have a much smaller number of billing units, but they have like a third of the cost. And so you can see that their demand charge in this case would have been like $366 a year. So what does that mean? Well, except for um, a single family customer class, and it might have more than one billing unit. So a nursing home, of which some of them are average, maybe size about 80, and usually about half of them, half of those units are Medicaid. So if they had 40, 40 beds that we were charged, they'd end up paying 40 times 387, which means their annual cost would be almost $15,000. Yes? Um, I thought you said the nursing homes were about 100% Medicaid. No, that's this is fully paid Medicaid. Yeah, so this is what we had, uh, you know. Uh, the but on your center. earlier slide. No, it said 128 were and 100. If you go back to this slide one more, there's a there's 117. There's a total of 245 units and 128 were Medicaid. Because it said, what's that 100% then under percent of Medicaid billing units? Well, that they, a nursing home has 100% of the billing, nursing has 100% of the Medicaid billing units. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, I misinterpreted that. Thank That's you. That's okay. We can always make that clear. And so a multifamily apartment building, in contrast with 10 units, would pay just $344, $345 a year for their, for their units. Okay, so any any questions so far? Yeah. When when you're allocating the costs, um, how did you handle the training? Um, is it based on how many trainings were fire or? We, well, we don't really we have missed? that, so we usually do it based on either the um, number of incidents or something like that. So it's more okay. like an inc incremental cost. You know, we could do it that way if we knew how much training was going on, and then we'd have to figure out how much time each training was. But 
for the most part, we uh, assume that it's you know some sort of added cost on top of every incident or every FTE. Yeah. Um, so, if I'm interpreting this correctly, I could be totally off here. If you know the business that's running a nursing home, you know they'd get charged fifteen thousand dollars a year, and they just get a bill for that then, or, or is this integrated in their property taxes, or just how how is that mechanism? How, how, through what mechanism are we billing them? <coughs> well, for this, most places um, and our other clients, it comes on their utility bill. Okay. So, however you bill, however often you bill it, um, that's how you would end up doing it. You could do it. Okay. I'm not sure. We talked a little bit about the billing system. So, you know, if you bill <coughs> every month, then you can do it every month. If you bill every two months on for water okay. or sewer, yeah. you know, the big thing is is when is to make sure you got all the billing units, and that was one of the things that we tried to make sure we had. Um, there were some that might, you know, if you were, think we use water to start off with, but if you were sewer only, then, you know, we might have missed that, but I think we've caught most of them, so. Mm. Okay, next slide. So this is the five-year <coughs> incident forecast. Again, it's basically about 1% one, 1 a year, so. And so you can see that the, the total's going up, but um, it's not going up dramatically. Uh, you know, you're talking five years, maybe we're talking going from about 80 more uh, EMS calls uh, compared to today into 2023. Um, now, as population grows some more, depending on what kind of population that is, it, it may grow a little bit faster. Um, it just depends on what that population is. Uh, next slide. So if you take the status quo, which is basically we have all the people that are staffed today, and so one of the things that we looked at is when we talked about the availability and demand, is that you usually have uh, at least one firefighter, the chief and training officer now, and a fire prevention officer, that's always here from like Monday through Friday, basically, you know, eight hours or so, and then everybody else is served by volunteers. Well, um, so that's sort of the scenario we go, and we, since we knew what, when the incidents occurred and what day they occurred on, we could figure out, okay, it was, if there was an, uh, a call and it was during the day, on a weekday, then probably we had a, fire, a paid firefighter plus one volunteer going out. And in other cases, if it was on a holiday or on the weekend, then we assumed that it would be two volunteers instead of a paid firefighter. <clears throat> so, if you look at this, again, uh, this is status quo. Um, the rates, you know, basically the costs are going up by inflation, and you can see the rates aren't increasing dramatically. Um, you know, for the most part. I mean, they're still high relative, certainly for nursing homes. Again, that's basically because of the way the availability in the EMS levy was allocated. So, we'll go to the next slide. So, if you do, and I understand that there's some thought about adding uh, more full-time firefighters, paid firefighters. So, if we did a scenario that said, we'll add one firefighter in 2019 and another in 2020, you can see that the rates start to jump up. Um, so in 2019, if you're a single family, you're jumping from $41 to $57 a year, and then by 2020, you're jumping to $72, so you've almost doubled, doubled that cost. Um, and again, part of it's because you've got fully paid firefighters now that when they have availability time, when they're waiting in the station, there's a real cost to that, whereas on a volunteer, if they're not going out, at least the way we calculated the stipend, they weren't really getting paid, so there wasn't really an availability cost. Okay, so again, you can see that those rates start going up pretty good in the next two years between 19 and 20. Uh, next slide. I have a quick question. Sure. Um, what was the, I guess, basis for, or justification for adding the, the two firefighters you know, assumption here? Uh, was that just like, you know, we'll, we'll, we presume we need this, or what was the justification for adding them? Uh, I, I, I meant to say it was a scenario that might happen during that, the budget that, that period. Was, that was a, just a scenario to run through, because one of them was status quo, the other one was that um, basically as we would get into the basic life support business, should we go that route, uh, technically, uh, we would maybe need more people, so at least that way there would be a full-time person around, basically, 
as often like as shift. possible yeah. to yep. assist the volunteers. And then my and then my bigger concern, because initially when we were looking at that, was well, you need two people to do that. Well, that's fine and dandy, but my bigger concern there is I want to make sure, hypothetically, if we were to do that, there was truly a need. So that was why uh, in there I uh, was looking at if we did go that route to maybe add one, uh, the one year, see how it goes, and then if you needed the other one, that was the numbers for that. So that was the premise behind okay, that. Okay, thanks. The other thing too that um, that is also uh, that you should know is all these rates are full cost. So that means all that five hundred, that total of five hundred thousand plus dollars is being picked up by these rates. And so you know, minus the the you know the EMS levy and whatever revenues you get from transporting. Yeah. Um, from a policy standpoint, that doesn't necessarily have to happen. I mean, you can use your general fund to offset that cost and keep those rates lower. That's that's just, again, that's one of the policy questions that we would have. Um, just to give you an idea, um, uh, you know, one way to reduce that, if you spread the, the EMS levy based on the ratio of demand cost and availability cost, then it would bring the rates down by quite, the, the, at least for the nursing homes and some of the others, it would bring the rates down a little bit, but the, it ends up that the single, the, the other, the rest of the uh, uh, customer classes end up picking up some of that extra cost that the nursing homes would have paid because you're giving some of that EMS levy money to help offset overall demand cost. Um, in comparison, um, we're asked to do some comparison. Now, here, this is a status quo scenario. Um, you know, you'd be down here on a monthly basis, you know, we're talking about 350. Richland, um, we are currently doing a cost of service study for Richland. I expect that this is going to get up there close to what Keno and Pasco is going to be at in terms of full cost. So these are not necessarily totally at full cost. Um, and Sunnyside is a much smaller city. One of the things that Sunnyside does in terms of the businesses that they have, um, instead of charging each commercial um, business just as one billing unit, one of the things they do, which is unique, is that they take the number of employees and then they divide by the number, the ho average household size to get the number of building units. So if you're a business that employs a lot of people, then when you divide that by whatever it is, three, three per average household size, you might have, you know, say 30 billing units that you end up paying. So, so that's a different thing that happens in Sunnyside. And like I said, um, this is going to, they haven't done anything for 10 years on this in Richland. Um, and Pasco and Kennewick, those are pretty current. We did cost of service studies, Kennewick, uh, probably uh, about a year or so ago, and maybe two years in Pasco. Um, and they started, originally they started when we uh, uh, did the original study for them in Pasco, I think we started at $12, and they've raised it to $15 and now. So, um, they've increased some of their costs too. But they're also going through some areas where they have a lot of a lot more development. So, and that 344 is that with the uh, two additions? No, or? that's a status quo. Status quo. So I think if if you were talking more like, um, it, it doesn't really change uh, too much. If you if you add the two staff, um, you know, by 2020, um, it would be. It would be more. It would almost double. It would be almost uh, twelve. It'd be like about seven dollars or so a month. So, any other questions? Okay. Next slide. So, what are your real policy decisions? Well, first of all, should you establish a, an energy utility? Um, secondly, if yes, uh, should the city set up a full cost recovery, which basically would be mirror some of these rates? Um, or should you, should you also, in terms of things, allocate some of that EMS levy funds to offset some of the demand costs, which is what we just talked about. Um, if not a full cost recovery, uh, how much general fund should be used to subsidize the cost of EMS and annual services? Um, and how should the general fund be used to offset that? Should we put it in availability? Should we put it in demand? Or should we divide it between both? Um, it's sort of really a policy question. Um, certainly, we could model and uh, determine how e each one impacts the, the rates, but uh, in any event, if you do have a, an annual utility, obviously any charges and rates you have is going to save 
some of the general some of the general fund some money because right now you're fully funded at one point one million dollars with your general fund plus the the EMS levy and and, and you also get those that's extra seventy thousand but it costs you more to transport them than actually you get reimbursement mostly because most of the transports in in this city are Medicaid or Medicare so and right now those rates have been very low and uh, there is a, a movement there was a movement uh, a couple of sessions ago to raise what they call the GMT which is the uh, transport fee and allow people to charge more than, and get reimbursed more for Medicaid and Medicare uh, transports but anyway this is the information that we have as of today so if there's any kinds of um, like I said, other types of scenarios or other questions you might have, certainly. Go ahead. Um, I was kind of curious, question two there, should the city set its ambulance utility rates at full cost recovery, is that typical or pretty rare that cities do it that way where they do the full cost recovery? I would say it's probably, um, it's not It's not typical that most places would do try to do full cost. We just um, did one where they actually did that, and that was Ocean Shores. Now they only have one fire station. Um, they only have. They just finished off uh, having a, a safer grant. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. So that allows uh, a federal. You get federal money and uh, to support uh, firefighters. And then I think like at the second year you have to pay so much. And then after about three years, you have to decide whether you're going to keep them or not keep them. And and one of the things that they have in most shorts, I mean, you just don't have a lot of. Uh, firefighters, I think we have maybe four on duty, and if you were to take away um, the safer people, which was like they got like seven people that they ended up funding, so they would put them in a pretty precarious position. Um, and they have a lot of concurrent calls. They get one of their issues is they get lots of tourists, and so they're providing a bigger population than what really is there during, the, say, the winter time. And so if they have more than one call, one of the things we did was analysis of how often do calls occur within 30 minutes of each other and so one of the issues there is you know if you have four that means you can at least keep have you can respond to two calls you know concurrently there's a, if there's a third call you're probably still going to be in trouble but that's very typical of small communities um, that have you know limited fire departments and staff so yes so if I understood this correctly, the ambulance utility can't pay for ambulances because that would be capital? No, we can pay for ambulance. You can't pay for the fire stations. Okay, so you can't pay for the building. Okay. Like so we could include, but we could include the ambulance recovery and, you know, the, yeah. the money that we're putting in all the time. Yeah, okay. for, you know, like those are replacement costs. And, you know, those, are, those can run up. I think you've got, it, from what I understand, the chief got a pretty good deal on that. The ambulance that you have so well and, and now we've started so this should be in the 2018 budget which is what you use right that we have money every year going in towards so that when we have to buy a new one we'll have the money mm -hmm. yeah. so so those replacement costs would be in there to replace the current one but not to add a second one right typically with uh, the ambulances you, you need a second one in case the first one has an issue so so that wouldn't be included in this. Yeah. So you need. Um, you usually should have. You should have a reserve. Otherwise, you'll have to end up calling. Now, you'll have to call Walla Walla to come and help you out. So. Um, so another question on this is, um, do we need a different kind of ambulance for transport? Um, no. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> no, the one you have is designed for transport. Um. Yeah, I know when I got transported, the what I assume it was Walla Walla because it was quite a while ago. Yeah. Um, it was pretty bare bones. It was like being strapped in the back of a delivery truck, <laughs> 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 which was fine because the the issue was I was the only driver and I couldn't drive. So, um, seems like I have one more question that it's it's escaping me. Oh, uh, so if if we do the ambulance utility. Then does that mean that we have to have our firefighters, etc., um, do a lot more um, in terms of like timesheets or something, tracking their time, so that every year we rebalance? Or 
How does that happen? No, usually we don't do these studies every year. And so, um, and given the trend where you don't have a lot of, your, your, what you basically see is your, the number of incidents that you have are fire relative to EMS or generally about the same. So once we do this, you may not have to do this. Now, if there was some big change in um, the incidents um, or the, or say the, the residential makeup or the makeup demographic makeup of your of your city, um, you know, it might be worth looking at again. But you know, like I said, I was quite surprised to see that you had you know a third of the calls are going to nursing homes. Now they're not all transported, but you're still going there. Um, you know, and I think they're they're pretty big, large homes. I mean, they're like what 80 beds or something like that, close to 80 beds average. And I understand there might be a newer kind of facility coming to town too. So. But, you know, for the most part, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, of our clients, they don't always go full, full cost recovery. And like I said, Ocean Shores was just the recent one that actually decided to go full cost, and that was uh, $19 a month, so. Actually, I do have another question. Sure. No, so, no. if we did not allocate the EMS levy funds to offset some of these costs. The dam demands. Man cost, yeah. Where, what can that fund, those funds be spent on? Well, it's still in there. It just goes to the availability cost. It doesn't go to the demand cost. Okay, so it's it can still, only go there. to. It's still got to go to EMS services. It's just the, the law actually says you've got to figure out what share of the EMS levy should be paid for by, you know, should be paid for by EMS, uh, the levy versus the utility rates. In this case, you know, in a lot of places, you know, we just put that against availability, but in this case, given some of the financial impacts, it may be that, you know, you might want to change that. But um, like I said, that's really a policy decision. Okay. Other questions? Oh, my question. <laughs> so I have some questions. Sure, good. So I'd like to see a scenario where we kept our current expense contribution going to the, the in, in the current dividing out between uh, both EMS and fire, because this assumes that all of those EMS costs are being supported by the utility. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're showing which full cost recovery. Yeah, full, full cost recovery. I'd like to, I'd like to see the, the, the current, if we kept our current expense contribution going there and, and we continue to add the two firefighters, and and I'd also like to see the 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 effect on the utility rates if we divided uh, evenly between uh, both availability and, and uh, demand. Yeah, I, I can tell you now because I've sort of done this. Um, mm -hmm. If you put the ratio of EMS levy towards the demand, uh -huh. that rate, it would reduce the nursing home charge from roughly over $300 to slightly over $100 per year. So it would dramatically impact. Um, so, I'd, but I'd like, I'd like to see those. I, I yeah. mean, we'd like to see the, we're not envisaging trying to save money sure. uh, by developing an ambulance utility from current expense. What we're trying to figure out is how do we make sure we pay for it all? Yeah, so let me just get clarification on the, so if we, if you're spending 1.1 million dollars now, right? What you're, if I understand you right, what you're saying is we we'll still spend 1.1 million dollars, but if we add the two firefighters, we would put those people on the in the utility. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. All right. And and the 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 same kind of cheapest. If, am I wandering off too far? I'm just making sure I understand as well. So I'd, we'd like to keep our current expense contribution, but use the utility to fund the expansion of the personnel, and divide the divide the those those contributions for the EMS levy across both demand and availability. Well, my my thinking would be is that um, that you will actually have more revenue because the, I'm not sure that say say the cost of the two firefighters is mm -hmm. roughly. Maybe, let's assume two hundred thousand dollars, and of that, um, 
maybe uh, let's say 150 of it is for EMS. So if we only have $150,000, basically your EMS levy pays for all that already. So um, I'm not sure. Again, we'll we'll run the numbers and let you see we'll see what yes. happens. Yeah. Um, um, and then I guess if we want to put in some sort of uh, amount for another ambulance, um, yeah. and that would be another yeah. at least. Uh, you know, we'll have to amortize it because, but, yeah. you know, you're talking another 250, uh, brand new, probably 250, 300 thousand dollars. Would you, know. you like a new ambulance, Chief? Someday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Miss Selby. Um, so, if we were talking about potentially wanting a fully paid firefighter always available, it typically takes five shifts to cover 24 seven. It's a seven day. If we want to cover 24 seven, 365, it's seven people. Um, so how far off are we from that? Cause I mean. Well, if we've got three full time right now. Plus yeah, two, but, get another two. But some of those full time are on the day shift. I don't think we want our chief working nights, although he might like that cause it'd be a lot less bureaucracy but <laughs> <laughs> so I just wondering how many and I don't expect that we have to have the answer tonight but so if you're so if you're looking to put somebody on 24 7 there's usually three shifts so you'd have at least three people not counting days off that they are required via contract vacation sick leave and all that determination of the city would then be do you backfill with another paid person or do you backfill with a volunteer or do you leave that shift empty and that's a policy decision for you folks to make currently i i would prefer to keep the fire marshal on days that's when business that makes are sense uh, i would prefer to keep the, the training officer on days or evenings so that you can see all the shifts and then myself so that would be three people on the not on shift work. Right. Currently, I have four people, so I would need to have two more to do the, the bare minimum of covering that 24 7. And then you folks would need to tell me how you would like me to fill any gaps. Yeah. Generally speaking, you know, it takes for every 24 7 position, it takes anywhere from three and a half to as high as four and a half positions to fill one, one on duty position. Yeah, we always just use the rule of thumb of five. Yeah. So. Yeah. So if you have three people, that means you have 50, you're going to have to hire 15 people. You have three people on, on duty all the time. Yeah, but we only wanted needed one on duty all the time. I'll take 15. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's that's why when we look at you know when you're t talking about Kennewick and you're talking about Pasco. I mean, every station has anywhere from three to four people yeah. full right. time. So that's that's why those numbers are quite a bit higher. Um, so I'm not really able to add small numbers tonight. So it sounds like we would need about four more, if I'm counting this correctly. Uh, I would need two more as a, a bare minimum. To, well, to get to five on shift. Five people per shift? Or no. Five people doing shift work, not you and the fire marshal. You four more. Okay. So, so I'm adding better than I think. So, is so that, I would is like that to see a to scenario where we don't cut back on our money. Although it sounds like our money is all going to have to go to the fire side. No. Um, to cut co and cover four more people, and they could be added one every so, year. A, in addition to the two, add an addition right. to. Right. I would like to see a scenario like that. Okay. Okay. I think I've got my sort of marching orders. If, any, if there's anything else um, that you can think of afterwards, certainly, you know, we'll leave it there. Michael and they'll yeah. email me and let me know. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, is stormwater. Well, folks, we've got a FCS double header tonight. 
Well, if you want to copy it. Oh, I've got, I've got, it, I've got it live. I would like to hear it. Thank you. So my name is Andy Baker. I'm a project manager with FCS Group. And I'm here to talk to you about the stormwater utility formation project that we're doing for you. We're working with Parametrics, who's your engineering consultant, on the stormwater management plan. And we've been also working closely with staff and uh, with Robert, who's not here, unfortunately. Um, and if at any point you have questions for me, please feel free to jump in. Uh, so what we're, uh, we're going to talk about, and I'm going I'm to try and move this along at a reasonable clip. So if you want me to go into more detail, I'm happy to. I'd love to talk more about this stuff. But I do want to be respectful of the amount of time that we have today. So uh, if you want me to go into more detail, uh, let me know. So we're going to go over what are we talking about with a utility formation? What the overall process of the of going through this great study looks like? It's probably sound a little bit similar, so I might be able to keep that abbreviated. Um, what the key policy issues that we have evaluated, discussed with staff, and then brought a recommendation for for you? What the revenue requirements look like for this new stormwater utility? Our rate recommendation and then what the next steps in this entire process are. All right, so the, uh, the regulatory driver for why we're talking about stormwater utility tonight is that beginning in 2019, or maybe from what uh, Mike told me today, based on a call from Ecology, maybe a little bit sooner than 2019, uh, the city is required. But, yeah. I, I should add a little bit. <laughs> Good, yeah, go for it. Uh, <laughs> so when Robert called saying that you know, they're going to this issue, he also informed me uh, that he ended up getting a call from the Department of Ecology yesterday where they're requesting a meeting with us to start following and then do that on national pollutant discharge elimination system, MPDS permit. Very good. There we go. Nobody uh, calls it that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because uh, they want to put us under the order to get the stormwater going as soon as possible. So they are on us to get this established. Originally, we were under the interpretation uh, that they were going to be a little more chill about it, maybe start them next year. Uh, however, from what was uh, communicated with me, that does not, no longer sound like the case. So, well, can I um, jump in? Yeah, yeah. So we have to be. And you are Angela Taylor with uh, Parametrics. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but why don't, you, why don't you step up then, okay, so yeah, we can yeah. record? Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. I guess I'll, I'll be a city staff. <laughs> yep. So I just wanted to jump in there. Um, DOE wants to have. College place under the NPDES permit by July 2019 because the Walla Walla permit that you're umbrella under will expire then. So we need to work through yeah. the process and have it in place before July. Yeah. So. Well, they'd like However, us to. Yeah. Well, um, no, it'll be a requirement. But it's a negotiable <laughs> requirement. <It's> a <laughs> well, well, actually, I, if our permit that we're under expires, it would be good for us to be under a permit. It gives us some regulatory yeah. cover, but that doesn't mean that the, all the requirements of the permit yeah. have to kick in on day one. Yeah. We absolutely should negotiate a time frame for the requirements for, yeah. to be kicking in. And, and, and we'll be getting into this, but it's really a phased approach. We're going to try to be putting more weight on the operation and maintenance side of them, more so in the construction and capital facilities. And, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And that makes sense. But even things like um, setting up the utility can be part of the permit, and so you can have a thing that says, "Okay, well, you've got a year after the permit starts to set up your utility, and then after you start collecting money, then you have more time to start doing the O and M, and then 
trust me, I know all how people like to postpone things. <laughs> yes. I, I worked at Ecology Stormwater for many years. I was the one that oversaw the Eastern Washington oh. Stormwater Manual. Excellent. <laughs> the phase two permits, etc. so I'm familiar with stalling tactics. Well, good, then we won't spend any time talking about what each individual minimum requirement is or any of that, because... <laughs> well, remember, I, well, I did oh, work there okay. for yeah. years, so I mean, remember, I got a dumb over here, so... You know. Well, and I left there nine years ago, so things have changed a bit. Sure. So, um, the timeline on this, as you say, this is the, the assumption that we are operating under is that we're aiming, or we have been aiming for being able yeah. to be ready to start billing people, have a functional stormwater utility January 1, 2019. That's the, what we're operating under for in terms of our assumptions. As you say, it is a negotiated process, and yeah. that's any leeway that comes along, great, but we want to make sure that you know what it would take to be able to do that on January 1. Um, so just very briefly, some of the benefits of having this set up as a separate utility, as a separate enterprise fund, is that it does mean that the stormwater program will be financially self-sufficient from the general fund, uh, gives you more reliable revenues for these ongoing costs that you are at some point going to need to be incurring. Um, and it also gives us the ability to more equitably recover those costs through rates that are tied to the cost of providing the service. And it, as a bottom line, gives some transparency and accountability to the public of what is our stormwater cost, program cost, and how is it being paid for. Um, yeah. Every, or every city that we worked with that tried to avoid having a utility, it never worked in the long run. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's pretty much the status quo here. Either in other states, sure, but with under ecology, that's uh, yeah. Um, so the process. There are two main areas where we uh, where we dive into this. One is just setting up the policy framework under which the utility will operate, and this is um, this is made up of fiscal policies which are largely in line with your existing uh, water and wastewater utilities. And then also some policies around how we design the rates, what we do in terms of credits. And then on the rate analysis side, we looked at what do we think the operating costs will be, what capital costs do you have to support, and that developed what we call a revenue requirement. And then we go through the process of designing the rate and that's as far as we are for today, because this has not yet happened, and so we've not begun anything along the lines of outreach or implementation. So, move along. So, I said uh, that the policy issues that we evaluated were related to fiscal, rate structure, and then rate credits. I have a little bit of more detail on them. Go to the next slide here. So, starting with the fiscal policies. Most of these, these are the key policies that we evaluated, discussed with staff, and then have a recommendation on. Most of these are in line with what you're doing with your water and waste water utilities. The operating reserves, uh, those are one-time initial amount of money that we want you to have on hand. They're intended to cover cash flow throughout the course of a fiscal year and any emergency costs that arise. It's not a annual amount of money that needs to be, that's being spent every year. Uh, we have a recommendation in here for, around debt service coverage that's really more there for sake of completeness because we are not recommending, see our capital funding uh, recommendation, we're not recommending that in this planning period you plan to use debt to fund any of your capital projects. Uh, as a new utility, it would be premature. Um, and so for the window that we're looking at, it's not a recommendation. We're recommending funding any capital with cash and grants. And then system reinvestment is a more of a target of, as a policy, what we want you to be working towards is being able to fund 
reinvestment in your infrastructure through the rate. And we generally recommend not trying to get there all the way, right immediately. This amount of money isn't tied directly to a capital project that your city engineer has identified as needing to happen in 2019. It's not tied immediately to your normal capital planning process. It's more from a rate philosophy standpoint. We want you to have a line item where you are setting money aside so that when you do identify projects, you have the cash to be able to pay, to pay for them, as opposed to having to go out and get debt. Yes. How does our existing stormwater infrastructure fit into that? So, in ter so what we have, what we have done with your existing stormwater infrastructure is well, I say we, uh, Angela <laughs> has uh, gone through and calculated what the if you had to replace it today, so what the current day of replacement cost of all of your existing stormwater infrastructure. And we are then in our recommendation saying you should plan to fund a annual replacement cost of that, so it's not exactly depreciation, uh, but essentially if you were depreciating on, on the replacement cost, be able so that you have enough money for when you actually do need to replace it. Okay. So that's the I basis just, for that assumption, but it's more of a rate philosophy target as opposed to saying in 2020 we're going to spend this exact amount. Right. I just um, misunderstood you to oh. say that it only applied to future. No, um, no. It's, it's actually only based on, so the amount in our <clears throat> recommendation for 2019 is based off of what you have today. Okay. Yeah, so what I did is I took an inventory, every catch basin, every manhole, pipe, uh, drywell, infiltration basins, and I tried to accommodate all of those and give a real world cost for now. Like Great. 2018, yeah. 19, cost. Right. And then in our projection, we're taking that amount and that's being scaled up based on construction cost inflation. Right. Um, our next slide is related. So the next major policy issue that we evaluated was related to rate structures. And I'm happy to go through all of these if you want, but I can tell you if you click once more, I think. So where we ended up with a is uh, recommending an impervious area based rate structure that uses equivalent service units or ESUs. I'll try and be good about those acronyms. Um, that's the most common rate structure in the state. And there's a good reason for it. It's that it is the one that, for most cities, gets the right balance of rate equity. So it's based off of a real rate driver, the actual impervious area that uh, folks have. It's a achievable level of data. When I say that it's based off of equivalent service units, or ESUs, um, what that means is that for every residential, single family residential customer, we're just gonna treat them all as one, one unit. They'll all pay the same rate. But it's for non-residential customers that we have a measurement of the actual amount of impervious area on their parcel, and their rate is going to be a, a multiplier or a function of how much impervious area they have relative to the average residential, uh, single family residential. Yes. It is kind of a layman over here. Could you please define impervious area? Yes. Impervious area is roofs, parking strips, tennis courts, uh, pools, I guess, maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, sources of anything, runoff, and Sources of run anything that's going okay. to generate runoff that it's is... The um, surfaces we're keeping. Yeah, so it's... But it includes both, uh, both uh, the the roof surface and then also parking strips and all of that. Um, and Angela can probably tell you more about the... And even gravel is considered impervious because the rate at which water, rainwater would run off of it is a faster rate. So we have to accommodate for that faster release of flow into the streams. So okay. Any hard surface. Because when you're doing gravel, you compact it. Um, um, Yes. So I've been trying to convince my employer to switch to pervious paving for their parking lots. Oh, that's so the perfect segue. There you go. 
So what would happen if I did that? Yeah, well, <laughs> so the next policy issue that we considered is rate credits for, so for single family, there are every single family residential being treated the same, so this doesn't apply to them, but for everyone else, where we are really going to a high level of detail of figuring out exactly how much impervious area they have, the recommendation is that there would be a process for if they do more than what is required, the bare minimum of what is required for on-site, that they would be eligible for a credit on their rate because they're reducing the cost to provide the service to them. Now, it's not going to be a 100% credit because when the process that we go through is we go and we look at if everyone did the maximum amount possible on their site, what costs would we still have to have as a utility? Because there are a lot of costs that are still going to be there. Uh, you're not going to, it's not going to cost any less to do the street sweeping that you have to do just because everyone's doing everything they need to on site. All of the reporting requirements and outreach and we'll get to the whole litany of uh, minimum requirements shortly. Uh, <laughs> Th those are all still going to be there. So, but there are a number of costs that will be reduced. Maybe if everyone was doing it on site, maybe some of your uh, the sizing of your capital facilities could be smaller. And so we've gone through a process of looking at all of the costs that exist and making a recommendation for what the total amount of the credit should be. Um, so let's, let's go on to the next one here, and I do have all of those. Permit requirements pulled up here. Thank okay, you. So I just provided these for SES. Um, basically, to comply with the 2019 stormwater permit that you will be under, you will have to complete the stormwater management plan, which we are currently in the process of completing. You'll also need to complete some public education outreach. So that's going to people and telling them about um, dog waste pickup, uh, don't wash your car, and not the runoff going to a storm drain. Uh, don't pour oil into the drain, similar stuff like that. <laughs> and just get people thinking about where the rain goes, where it travels. So you want to involve the public in that process. Um, participation in developing some of the strategies for dealing with stormwater. And then also uh, looking at illicit discharge. So if you have some cross um, contamination between a sewer pipe and a storm pipe, you know, some of those would be considered illicit or if somebody did have a, a big spill and it got into the storm system. So you would want to maintain a, a process of public outreach. If that does happen, then you call a public, um, public works director or uh, one of the maintenance guys. And then just how your operation and maintenance works, like um, where they take their street sweepings, how often are they cleaning up catch basins, how often are they sweeping the streets, stuff like that as part of your operation needs. How you're dealing with um, <coughs> fertilizer, stuff like that. And then uh, how you monitor all of those activities. And finally, um, construction sites. So anything that's over an acre gets a DOE and PDES permit that is related to the construction site. So the city would want to make sure that each project gets one of the, those permits, that they have a certified CSAT on staff, and that they're maintaining those facilities, the BMPs, silk fence, pitch basin and lights, stuff like that during construction. And then finally, the city has to oversee uh, the DOE mental environments for conveyance, treatment, and detention on site. So making sure that the drainage report includes all the minimum DOE requirements. So that takes money just to do that. <laughs> yeah, the takeaway there is that these are a lot of new things that you, this new utility, you as a city, are going to have to be able to have staffing to do. And the assumption that we have in here is that this is going to take two additional maintenance workers to be able to support all of the all of the monitoring, O and M requirements, illicit discharge and detection. All of those activities are going to take two additional staff people, and then there's also going to be some additional costs associated with uh, that are more. Um, more line item costs uh, associated with the public education and outreach and the public involvement, those sorts of things. And so if we look to the next slide, from an operating cost standpoint, meeting all of those is really driven by 
salaries and benefits on two new additional staff people. And then we also have in here a portion of the city engineer's time because he's going to be involved <coughs> in dealing with all those permitting requirements that Angela mentioned. Because he's not busy enough right now. Right, right? exactly. Yeah. 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 And so, one of those yeah. staff members would be more of an engineering base. <coughs> okay, so he, some of that might be offloaded on the one of them. Oh, okay. Yeah. That, that's he probably idea. appreciates that. That's the idea of the two positions. The other one would be a O and M uh, position under Paul, and then the other one is like an engineering tech type position under Robert. Okay. Yeah. Um. So I'm not quite sure if this is the right point for this question, but one of the <laughs> things that shocked me. Oh, well, this is probably for oh. both of you. <laughs> one of the things that shocked me when I moved to College Place was the whole. Oh yeah, you just dump your leaves in the street, and then we come sweep them up. Sometimes up to a month later. So, sometimes three or four months later. Yeah, and so the <laughs> catch basins are like packed, and I'm like, in the back of my head, I've been thinking, there's no way you're going to be able to do that when you have a stormwater permit. And I mean, the only way that you could do it that I can see is if they get swept up like really fast. Right on a um, schedule. Or yeah. So, um, are, are you looking at that? And that is going to take a lot of public outreach. Yeah, I haven't specifically dealt with that one, but in Pullman we do the same thing, and they are under the MPES phase too. And they still have us put our leaves into the street to make them sweep them up. But yeah, then you have to maintain your catch basins more and just make sure that you're not getting those. Well, and, and you I'm kind of wondering them. if it's going to. You mean an even bigger hit on the O and M? Potentially. I mean, you have identified in the capital plan for this two uh, two uh, acquisitions that will be, I think, related to that. One is a vector for cleaning out those catch basins, and the other one is the street sweeper. So, so those um, those will help with that. Um, how do you clean up your leaves, though? Is it with a front-end loader and a dump truck? Uh, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a, there's a bucket loader yeah. and, and a guy with a shovel. Oh, okay. So I'll talk to Paul and maybe come up with some strategies that we can include in the, yeah. the plan. Well, one of the things that I think we should really think about is, I mean, if we're going to do... Well, first off, if we're going to have a utility without getting, you know, a lot of really angry people, um, we need to be starting to do some outreach right away. And one of the ways that we can make public involvement actually be real is, you know, talk about some options for that. I mean, one of the things that you can do instead of that is to give everybody the green bin, pick it up, and have it composted. And yes... On one hand, that um, potentially has a cost to it, but is that really a bigger cost than picking the leaves up off the street and leaving them sit there for three months until they're frozen under the snow, and then you can't park and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I mean, I so you know, ask giving people like various options and saying, okay, this is how the cost would lay out and which way do you think we should go. I think would really be helpful in getting people on board with this. You know, we have some leverage now with the unlimited pickup. Exactly. Uh, and and we may want to consider doing things like paper bags for leaf disposal. Mm. Uh, and well, Richland um, actually found when they, but they own their own landfill. But they actually found it paid them to give people the um, the green bins. Yeah. And compost because it that way their landfill will last so much longer. Yeah, it's, I mean, there's a, I think I, we, so, we have a variety of options. Right, and so I think this is one of those places where it really makes sense to do some what I call real public involvement, where we're actually trying to get them to give us to help us make a decision, as opposed to well, we've decided, um, you know, how mad are you going to be? <laughs> <laughs> no, well, we have a lot of expertise on how mad we're going to be with garbage. So, yeah. so maybe on a secondary, uh, maybe it'll be a date we can come up with a public information session in the summer so that we can come up. And maybe even in the middle of the day on a Saturday or something if you want 
I'd suggest the farmer's market. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the yeah, farmer's market yeah. would be good. Maybe, maybe do a brief presentation. This is all talking. Yeah. No, no, no. It's, it's a, it's, well, but it's it goes great. into, it, yeah. It, it comes back to, yeah, part of it is what would they like from a whatever, but it does come back to what, what is the cost difference. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so I can make up some post-it boards and provide some information, and that way they know the basis of why and what we can do, and maybe some input. Yeah, I think that would be great. Okay. And, you know, maybe in tight, trigger the, uh, tie that with an online survey or yeah. oh, we can like you know we can always try and put the business students to work again absolutely yep. uh, absolutely all right so um, the remainder of the costs that are up here besides salary and benefits we have do have uh, that regulatory mandated programs one is to cover the education and public outreach costs and then the rest of these are the uh, administrative costs and taxes, these are uh, frankly pretty lean costs, but I do think they're realistic. We based it, uh, again, we're creating a new utility. We don't know exactly what the administrative costs are going to be, but we based it on your water and wastewater utilities. So we think that these are realistic. We do have a small contingency on the total amount that we're putting into the revenue requirement because this is new. <laughs> we don't know. We don't presume to know exactly what everything is. And when we're setting a revenue requirement, really our goal as as rate consultants is to make sure that what we tell you is going to be a high enough rate to pay for everything is going to be a high enough rate to pay for anything. So I just want you to know we do have a small contingency in there that isn't exactly this cost that has been identified because we expect that things will come up, especially in that first year of of operating. All right. Um, with capital costs, uh, as in, so this is the total cash needs for capital projects that have been identified. That includes acquiring a vector, acquiring an additional street sweeper, and then a number of, um, of actual projects that uh, Angela has identified as needs to have. I'm gonna, it's not gonna jump ahead too much, but so this is the total amount. So is the, is the 2020 amount the, the a new vector and a new street sweeper? Is that so? The 2020 amount is a is a new vector and a portion of a streets project. Yeah. It's it's what we anticipate the stormwater share of a streets project is going to be. Um, and I can we have a I have a listing of all those if you'd like it, but no, that's um, okay. I want to. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Let's go to, so our rate recommendation, here's the meat. So Angela did a detailed analysis of a statistically representative sample of your single family residential homes. Based on that, the average residential uh, parcel has 3,500 square feet of impervious area. So that's how we define our equivalent service unit. From that, Angela also looked at, okay, everybody who's not a single family residential, how much impervious area are they going to have? Because we need to take that and divide it by that 3,500 to figure out how many, when we go and bill people, how much total, how many billing units are we going to have? Working with the revenue requirement and our billing units lets us know what does our rate need to be? $9.18 a month. So that's for every single family residential is going to pay that, regardless of the exact uh, amount that they happen to have on their parcel. The reason that we do that is measuring every single house and we'd have to hire on. two more people. Yeah, no, we're not yeah. just yeah. for that. It's, it's very <laughs> onerous and is uh, has diminishing returns on uh, the equity of it. For non-residential, though, as I said, it is going to be based on the real measured uh, amount for each one. And so they will be charged $9.18 per equivalent service unit per month. So if they have 7,000 square feet of impervious area, they would pay double that. Um, the on-site mitigation credit, a maximum credit per ESU of $2.63. And as I said, that's based on that analysis we, that we did of what it, how much will costs go, could costs go down if everyone was mitigating to the maximum amount possible. And then we're also recommending that, so this is for, that's for 2019, we're recommending that 
from there, from 2020 to 2024, which is sort of the period that we're looking at here, inflationary level rate increases just to keep pace. All of the major cost drivers that you have are, we would expect to, in aggregate, be going up at about 3% a year, so we're recommending that your rate would keep pace with that. Any questions on that before we move off? All right. Next is, so what do you get for that $9.18? I want to, so that was, uh, we, the $9.18 does not cover with cash from your rate payers the full capital cash needs. It covers your operating costs. In the first year, it covers funding that operating reserve. It's a one-time thing. Once you've got it, then you're good. And it does provide some capital funding through the rate every year, but it doesn't meet the full cash need because we are, with much discussion with staff and figuring out what is a reasonable rate to have, we are saying, click it once more, that the difference of what is generated by the rate and the full capital cash needs is going to need to be made up with grants. And so that's the message that we go back to Ecology with and say, here's what we think is reasonable for the ratepayers to cover, but if they're not going to come up with the full cash needs for all the capital, you need to come with some grants to make this happen, or it's going to take longer for us to be able to do those things. Because it'll, we're generating some capital revenues, or some revenues for capital, but it would mean, okay, we're going to gonna, we're gonna push out to 2021 before we can do that project, instead of getting to it right away. I is also I guess something too with our rates. I'm trying we're trying to make sure that from an economic development nexus we remain competitive with our neighbors because we're Can in the next environment slide. right now where as long as we're lower even a little bit, I think we have some big wins coming ahead of us. And if we jump the gun and overshoot and get ahead of our neighbors, we could shoot ourselves in the foot as far as gains from the private sector. So uh, even so even though I know that there's a big gamble saying, hey, we're going to make them give us grants, uh, we're also trying to capture some of that additional property and sales and hotel tax should what we think is coming our way come our way. Well, and the other argument that I think is a very strong one is we are not asking them to give us grants and then we have a utility that doesn't pay the freight of being able to cover the replacement cost. So if we did not have that in there, then I think it would be pretty lame yeah. to say, yeah, we've got a utility that covers our operating costs, but every time we need capital, we're going to come to you for a grant. Yeah. They'll see right through that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it looks like it looks like over the next six years, about a million and a half in which in is grants. really not that much money. Oh, it's well, it's yeah, a million here, a million there. Yeah. You're talking from money the state, pretty sure. <laughs> yeah, from, from, from the state, well, that's not. what I mean. Yeah. From the yeah. state yeah. side, that's yeah. really not that much no. money. It's um, for us, yeah, that's yeah. a lot. Yeah. But yeah. Um, well, well, I think the 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 work with the wells yeah. and, the, and the capital budget demonstrates how well we can do that. Yeah. Well, and I think between the economic development argument and the replacement argument, I think we've got a really strong argument for grants. As you can see on the slide, but I'm, we're trying to this, make sure yes. <laughs> it's pretty evident. Yeah. 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 This is what we're staying conscious of when really getting to what is that reasonable level that shows we're not just saying we're not going to do anything, but if if we if we wanted to fund the full amount, you'd be closer to fourteen dollars. So, so I have a question about the credits. Yes. Um, what is the baseline for getting the credits? Mm. Um, so is it like, are we going to be doing a, a inventory in the early years and that's the baseline? And so is it better for some, and then what about these new constructions? Places that are coming in, is it better for them to build in less 
um, impervious surface from the beginning, or is it better for them to have a higher baseline and then go correct it later? So our general recommendation is that you make the credit available on an application basis. That you don't go out and say, we're going to go and with our staff that is, even with two oh, staff. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. <laughs> we're not gonna, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so what we tend to observe is that on new development, they're very keyed into it. For existing development, honestly, we don't see that many retroactively applying. Some do. Large facilities that have already made investments will come and, and, and apply for it. But we very rarely see someone going in, as you described, going in and putting in all pervious pavement if they weren't already planning on doing something just to get that credit. And they still have to meet the DOE minimum requirements. So depending on the trip count, they have to do oil, metal, and basic treatment. They have to detain the water for half the two year, the 25, and they have to convey them. And then they also have to um, size their piping and then from the site to the city system so that it can raise that. So that would be your baseline. Right. Anything above and beyond okay. that. Okay, so the be baseline isn't really impervious area, it's re beyond requirements. Yes. Okay. That was, I Is was thinking it was impervious area, and I was like, no. That's going to be really confusing. So, yeah, okay, I yeah. get it now. Sorry. So no. see if they kept all of their stormwater on site and only the 100 year ever went into the city system, they would get a credit there. Yeah, th that would probably be the level of me getting to the full full credit, which is still only $2.63 per mm -hmm. equivalent service unit off of that $9.18. Because they're still benefiting from all of the other programs right. that you are going to have to meet your requirements. All right, uh, next slide here. So it's most of what I have for you, except that really this is the meat. <laughs> this is the meat. <laughs> the next steps are really the meat of what uh, we're thinking about, where this needs to go, and what happens next. So um, rated options up there just because, you know, that, that needs to be there. But really, there, at some point, uh, you will have to adopt something uh, in, with regards to a rate, and it could be that, but <coughs> we are not, at this point in the course of the analysis, ready to have that be a final number for you or have all of the work that is necessary to flip the switch today because the real big hurdle for implementation is we need to get our full billing database of who all we're going to build, what it actually looks like. And once we have that, then we have an opportunity to go back and true up our rate analysis. Because the analysis that has done, been done so far still has some assumptions that are baked into it for where we are in the course of the study. And so there's pretty confident in the number that we're presenting with you today, but we knew that you weren't going to vote on it, so we <laughs> there's there's still some work to be done. <laughs> um, the other piece, as we already started talking about, is outreach, and uh, yeah, your point about making the outreach effective is very well received. That it that isn't something that just happens at the at the end of the process. <coughs> if we can start doing that early, then that's always a positive. Um, and then our, on our plate is eventually uh, preparing a study report for you just to document all of this for the record. Um, any other questions? This may be for staff more, but um, do we, is there some sort of process that we have to go through to uh, create a utility? Yes. And what does that look like? Is there public hearings, etc.? Um, I don't know on the public hearings. I haven't gotten into the detail of it, but we definitely have to adopt the diet ordinance. And, and set up a fund. I will. I would. I would tell you we'll do a public uh, process. Yeah. Uh, and same, same question for the ambulance fund. Although, isn't it has a 
It has its own bill, I, yeah. I there, assume there, it has. There's specific um, things you have to have a public uh, hearing. You've got to show the cost of service. You've got to show what the impacts it would have on everybody else. So, yeah. And before you pass it. And, and, and both of these would require a codification of a municipal code chapter from yeah. the high observer. So, yeah, we do a okay. lot yeah. more than this public hearing. It's it, to do to 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 get there by July first is almost Herculean. Yes. Well, and which is I got why, it out. <laughs> which is why I, um, my suggestion would be that you kind of push back on having the utility ready day one of the permit. Yeah. But it's just I, I have a meeting set up with my. When I go over there in a couple of weeks to fight for our under curb grant, so Good. yeah, we should be able to get that taken care of. She's been cooperative about other issues. Yeah, yeah, I think it will be. And and we do have in our scope to help to prepare draft ordinance language for you. We've done this for yeah. many municipalities. So yes. Um, yes. Um, but yeah, uh, are there any other? Things related to the analysis, additional scenarios that you would be interested in seeing, um, or other questions that you may have. Um, the one I kind of like the scenario the way it is now, but the one um, thing that I think would be helpful is to get an idea of if we don't get grants, how long would it take before oh. we could do those capital projects? Absolutely. Yeah. Because I think we are pretty close to our debt limits. I'm not sure new debt is really um, doable for us. Because well, yeah. what's left of our debt limits, we kind of need to hang on to in case of more emergency yeah. emergencies. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean part of the part of the objective of creating this utility as its standalone enterprise is that once it's established and is a going affair, it you could potentially revenue bond against its revenues without right, hitting yeah. your other debt limits. So But that's but that's a... that's further out I'm just <laughs> a general reasoning. Um yes, that we just, we can absolutely prepare prepare that scenario for you. Yeah. Um as a taxpayer myself, I like to limit the amount of interest we pay. Absolutely. Here here. Yeah. So and I think that would be really helpful when you're talking about grants yeah. is to say, you know, yeah, we can do this in 15 years or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And because we, we are planning to have some amount of revenue generated for capital, it's not like we're not going to do it. It's right. just going to take some revenue. So that's, I think, a good piece of the negotiating strategy as well. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Any further items to discuss? Where's everybody else? <laughs> serious. Like, <laughs> well, we, we, we. I mean, I get my migraine shots tomorrow. Michael is clearly not in, in the shape, uh, well, and yet we managed to show up. <laughs> we know. We we know that that Heather is is off on a cruise to Alaska. Lauren is off in someplace strange. I don't know where March is this evening. She usually calls in. Yeah, I hope she's uh, okay. Really, I just have allergies, so I'm not really that bad off. Okay. okay. Well, you say, so we'll, like we'll try we'll try public embarrassment for the others that didn't <laughs> yeah, bother. Exactly. We need like a wall of